<clears throat> Our guest is one of the oldest friends I have in the Italian American profession. Did you and say one of the only friends you have? <laughs> one of the only friends. <laughs> uh, and I'm not sure of that sometimes. But <laughs> let's go forward. Uh, Rich Giuliani, that's spelled with a J. Uh, and he's of uh, no relation. Right. The spells it with a G. Yeah. And, uh, he is uh, from uh, Pennsylvania and uh, has... Uh, he's a sociologist who attended Northway, Notre Dame University and uh, as an undergraduate. Where did you get your graduate degree? Uh, uh, I took my master's at Rutgers in New Brunswick. And, oh, okay. Uh, the PhD uh, came from the University of Pennsylvania. Okay, well, uh, Eastern and Midwestern in, in his education and uh, started as a sociologist, was uh, very active in the American Italian Historical Association in the, it probably goes back to sometime in the uh, mid um, uh, 70s or the early 70s uh, and was president of that organization in the 80s and 90s and has written uh, a major book called Building Little Italy that focuses on Italians before mass migration. My prejudice has always been to think of Italian Americans as only those who came after mass migration. But Rich has found uh, a, uh, a, a mother load of information about Italians in Philadelphia before uh, mass migration, before 1880. And so uh, I'm pleased to introduce to you my very old friend, Rich Giuliani with a J. Thank you, Dominic. Uh, and I'll begin by uh, two things, two very personal things. Uh, one is our family name was once upon a time spelled with uh, E Lungo. Uh, it was Giuliani. Uh, although in the communal cemetery where my grandparents were buried in the Molise, uh, both spellings are given the I spelling and the J spelling. So uh, it, it seems to be a name change that after my father arrived in the United States in 1922, but actually uh, the, the J spelling preceded his arrival. He used to talk about how difficult it was for Americans to say Giuliani uh, and uh, uh, left us with the impression that he changed it from I to J to uh, enable these uh, Americani to have an easier time with it. Um, so that, that's, let's put the name issue aside for a moment. But the other thing uh, I wanna add is uh, I, I, I see just uh, uh, Corsino and Riccio here besides you, Dominic. Uh, and uh, as I often said, when I came to AIHA meetings, I always had a very strange experience of making new acquaintances and feeling like I've known these guys for a long, long time. <laughs> Were not they on the corner in, uh, I grew up in Camden, New Jersey, just across the river from Philadelphia. And everybody I met at AIHA, and I see it again today, uh, they all look like guys I remember from the neighborhood. And uh, so it's great to see you again because it's been a long time since I've been back to the old neighborhood. Uh, and it's, it's a wonderful feeling. Um, I, uh, uh, Lenny Moss, the great Lenny Moss once teased the hell out of me at a meeting because I gave the uh, introductory plenary welcome uh, address that year. I think, in fact, we were in Chicago. And I said, you know, I have this strange feeling come Christmas Eve all the time that I wished I could be together with all of you at that most sacred moment of the year because it was such an important time for me personally and privately. And I suddenly realized uh, with whom I wanted to share it most of all, who my brothers and sisters really were. So it's good to see uh, uh, you folks again and uh, good to be back um, uh, with you. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background of how I came to write uh, on, on uh, the whole series of books that I've, uh, I've dealt with here. Uh, Building Little Italy came out of a continuation, what I thought was going to be a continuation of my dissertation. I had, uh, uh, my, for my doctoral dissertation, I had fell in, fallen under the influence of a man named uh, 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 Edward P. Hutchinson, who taught uh, demography at the University of Pennsylvania. 
And he, uh, his middle name was Prince, Edward Prince Hutchinson, and he was a prince of a man. He had roots that went back to colonial America, and he was a super wasp who had this wonderful Maine accent, which we thought was a British accent at that time, but it turned out to be a Maine accent. Um, and um, uh, while I was taking his course, he uh, asked me if I was interested in doing research on Italians in Philadelphia. And of course I said, yes, very eagerly said yes, because even as an undergraduate, I had written a couple of papers while <laughs> in college at Notre Dame on uh, aspects of Italian experience, uh, one on the immigration laws and uh, another on the uh, treatment of Italians in terms of prejudice and discrimination. So I, I, had, uh, I had some slight roots going back with this intellectual interest. And Hutchinson grabbed me uh, while I was taking his course on international migrations and uh, asked me if I uh, was interested in, in doing this in Philadelphia. Uh, and I said, yes. And uh, he wanted me to meet this priest who was the unofficial archivist of the Archdiocese of Philadelphia because he felt we were sitting on a real mother load of uh, 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 raw material uh, that should be examined by some eager student. And he also felt, it was very strange to hear it come from a demographer, that um, uh, immigration had already been too much studied by demographers, by economists, and all kinds of other, other specialists. But somebody in social theory and social structure, which is what my training was in, uh, was desperately needed to examine uh, immigration. And I thought, OK, this sounds, uh, this sounds uh, very good to me. So I was uh, happy to uh, move in this direction, especially under this prize of a man who, many years later, I discovered, uh, I think he let, it, uh, let the cat out of the bag that before he came down to Philadelphia and, and became a faculty member at Penn, he had been teaching at MIT and at Harvard uh, where he took his, his own graduate training. And uh, while teaching an undergraduate course at Harvard, he had a student uh, named Oscar Hanlon, whom he said was a pretty good student. Uh, and it, it, when we heard this story, it blew us away because we were going back to the very beginnings, the very roots of the study of American immigration. Uh, and uh, Edward Hutchinson had, uh, was a part of it. Edward Hutchinson was an extremely dignified, gentlemanly, throwback kind of, of guy. So I was glad to have the opportunity to work uh, under him, except uh, he was very laissez-faire and I needed, I think I needed a little bit more structure and a little bit more push from some people, which I had to go to other people to get. But in any case, I did a bunch of things for that dissertation. And one of the things that I did that uh, got a little bit of attention, this was in the late 1960s, is I went into public parks in South Philadelphia with a tape recorder and um, uh, met some uh, social workers that were employed uh, in these Department of Recreation uh, locations where they had uh, bocce courts and they also had uh, facilities for the men to play card games and just sit around and chat with one another. So I was looking at a, a, an untapped population of men who had arrived here in the early 20th century uh, and they were, uh, I found out that I could get some of them to talk to me and allow me to tape record these interviews with them about why they chose to come to Philadelphia and all, and all that went with it. Some of them were willing to talk to me. Some of them were not willing to talk to me. And my wife was reminding me the other night of a story that I came home with once. I used to come home on one day and say, I hate these guys. I hate all of them. Uh, uh, I, I don't like going down there. I don't like doing this work. And she, she knew that uh, you didn't get any good interviews today, did you? No, I didn't. The following day, I would come back home and I would say, I love these guys. They're great. They're just wonderful to be around. And she'd say, you got a few good interviews today. Yeah, I got a couple of good interviews today. But um, I did this dissertation on their lives, uh, which was subtitled The Social Organization of Immigration. Uh, actually, that was the principal title. The subtitle was The Italians of Philadelphia. Uh, and um, I, I, I was very pleased with it. Uh, but uh, I wanted to do something that went beyond it. Uh, and I decided I wanted to write a comprehensive history of this uh, Italian presence in Philadelphia. I had read some local historians, uh, a guy named Edwin Wolf, for instance, who said uh, in, a, in a, a very important work on Philadelphia, he said that uh, a city doesn't have a single history. It has many different histories. Each group that is part of its population 
has its history. And I, it resonated with me and I thought, yeah, and the Italian Americans have their history and it needs to be told. It needs to be uh, recorded, it needs to be captured, it needs to be preserved, it needs to be told. And a whole bunch of us were coming to that conclusion in different parts of the country, in various locations. In Chicago, people like Vecoli and uh, Umberto Nelli, uh, in, uh, in Boston, in San Francisco, uh, it was all over the country. Uh, it was during that period of the late 60s, early 70s, when we were having a revival of interest in the study of ethnicity uh, in America. So I sat down to write the history of the Italians in Philadelphia. And I ended up with the beginnings of a manuscript that was about 120 pages or so. It was, it was getting up there in, in terms of the numbers. And I had just cracked the early 1800s. And I thought, my God, this is gonna be like 800 pages, this, this book, that I, when I finish it. So I called, I called up Hutchinson and I said, can you come over to our house next Sunday morning and have, have, we'll have a brunch together and I, I need to talk to you about some things. And I explained to him that I had a manuscript that was already starting the Atlante, but I had just cracked the early 1800s uh, because there were Italians here in the Philadelphia area uh, in the colonial period and in the Revolutionary War era uh, and I had written about them as much as I could. And I was just beginning to talk about a more collective experience. Um, and I was getting this, uh, monstros this monstrosity of a, of a final package was proje being projected in my own mind. And he said to me, well, you know, uh, everybody thinks that there are no Italians here until mass migration. And there isn't a whole lot written about what happened before mass migration. Maybe you ought to think in terms of a book that focuses on the Italian experience before the mass migration, which is what building Little Italy is all about. And uh, what I, the argument that I basically make was, well, the first concentration that is visible from uh, manuscript census material is in the 1850, 1860 census period. Uh, you begin to get clusters of Italians and you also begin to get chain migrations because I began to detect that these guys were coming from the same parts of Italy. And as in the case of Chicago, Boston, and San Francisco, they were coming from Liguria. They were coming from hill towns above the city of Chiavari, which many years later, I finally got to visit. And my wife still says, you were so thrilled that day you stood under the railroad sign for Chiavari because in those early days, Chiavari was such a magic word for you. But they came from hill towns uh, it, it, from an area that had long sent out uh, uh, immigration uh, from Italy. You remember Robert Foster and his uh, great book, The Italian Immigration of Our Times, uh, recounts the aphorism that if you break open an egg anywhere in the world, out will jump a Genovese. <laughs> and that's what I was finding about Philadelphia. And I was later going to discover, which I didn't write about, uh, left it for other people to deal with, that Chicago, Boston, San Francisco, all had these early pioneers from Liguria, uh, from pretty much the, the hill towns. Uh, they were pretty much street peddlers, uh, often street musicians, yes, with the monkey and all of that. Uh, and uh, they, I, I thought their importance had never really been sufficiently recognized that they were pro providing a foundation for the Italian experience. They were providing a scaffold, if you will, for the mass migration, because by the time you reach the, the 1870 census, there's a visible Italian community. There are Italian shops here. There are the, the specialty uh, retail places that are bringing in, starting to bring in imported foods to uh, uh, cater to the Italian tastes. Uh, and there is a bit of a community here. It's small, yeah, but I think its significance uh, needed to be stressed. And that's what I tried to do in this particular book. In the course of, of, of doing uh, this book, uh, I spent a lot of time at a church in South Philadelphia, St. Mary Magdalene de Pazzi, not Dei Pazzi of the crazy, Dei Pazzi of the Pazzi family. So the, 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 the uh, uh, preposition is just D-E, not D-E-I. Say Mary Magdalene de Pazzi. Uh, Pazzi was the family name of a distinguished Florentine saint. Uh, and say, the Church of St. Mary Magdalene de Pazzi was founded in 1853 as the Italian mission. It was before the, the revision of canon law in which um, missions became uh, 
full bore parishes. Uh, so you had missions with rectors, and in the Italian case, uh, all the early formations were uh, Italian missions with a rector and did not officially become a, a, a parish until 1910 with the revision of canon law. But it was widely understood this was the Italian parish, of course. Founded in Philadelphia in 1853, it's the first uh, church dedicated to uh, exclusive use of Italians anywhere in the United States. And I had gotten access to their sacramental records. The pastor at the, the, the present at the, that time uh, in the mid 1960s is what was let me look at uh, is ancient um, uh, sacramental ledgers where I began to look at the baptisms. And this is where I began to see the names of the uh, the uh, uh, people from the hill towns above Chiavari, certain names, Chicania is one of the towns, kept repeating themselves over and over and over again. And I realized that this was really a Genovese church, which is how it came to be known later on, uh, even more visibly later on. But in the course of doing that, uh, working in the rectory with the, the church files, which got into uh, building Little Italy, uh, one afternoon, I was prowling uh, upstairs in the above the main chapel of the church, which is now by 19 by the 1960s is a very important parish in South Philadelphia. And as I said, the oldest, first and oldest Italian parish, exclusively Italian parish for Italian Catholics anywhere in the United States, Mary Magdalene de Pazzi. Uh, I was there with this very elderly uh, Augustinian priest, uh, uh, Father Natale wonderful name because he was Father Christmas to me. Uh, and we were up looking for material that may have been uh, the domain of Monsignor Isoleri, who came to Mary Magdalene de Pazzi after a very troubled period uh, in which the church was actually closed by the local bishop. And there was a lot of tension, a lot of Irish Italian tension. Uh, and when it was reopened, they brought in this young priest, a recently ordained priest named Antonio Isoleri, uh, from a town called Villanova del Benga, uh, a little bit further up the coast, the Ligurian coast, to be the fifth or sixth pastor he was. 1870, he stays as pastor till 1926, 56 years pastor. I once asked uh, an archivist in the Archdiocese, uh, the Archdiocesan Archives, uh, do you think we could say that Isoleri was the longest running pastor in the history of American Catholicism? And he said to me, well, uh, for a long time, nobody kept any records of this kind of stuff. And you really um, uh, have to take your own uh, risks uh, to make a claim like that. But it, it very, he very well could have been the longest pastor in an American Catholic history, but 56 years is uh, arguably a good length of time. Um, and um, he left a personal manuscript collection. I don't know how many pages, I tried to count them one, uh, one afternoon and I got to about 10 or 12,000 pages. And I looked at this crate that uh, Father, Iso, uh, Father Natale had, uh, this is, I didn't finish that part of the story, where we went up into the attic of the, the church the, over the main chapel to look for uh, anything Father Isolari may have left, the long-term pastor who had died in 1932. And uh, while we're rooting around up there, uh, Father Natale says to me, Rich, you see that crate over there? That's Father Isolari's, Monsignor Isolari's personal papers. Would you like them? And I started shaking at that point, and I said, yeah, I would love to have them. So I brought them home, and as I said, I kept them under my desk for about 10 years, frankly, because uh, they're written in 19th century Italian, most of them. They're written, some of it is written in dialect, some of it's written in standard Italian. Um, I had a very close friend who was the uh, compiler of the first and widest selling Italian American English dictionary in the world, Bob Melzi, who taught at Widener University near here. And he was lived down the street from me by good chance. And I would call Bob up on the phone and say, Bob, I've got this letter from Isolari. And he uses a strange verb. And I've gone through my six dictionaries here and I can't find it. Uh, and Bob would laugh and say, it's a 19th century Tuscan verb that hasn't been used since the 19th century. And tell me what it meant. He was an incredible guy. Once, on the Penn campus, I asked uh, 
a, a young woman who was on the faculty, did you ever know Bob Melzi? And she said, Bob Melzi is a mythic figure in this department. Well, he was my great resource for language issues. Uh, and um, out, out of those, what I, I, I tried to count the Isolari papers. And as I said, I got about 10, 12,000. I looked at my crate and I thought, I'm not even halfway through this crate. I think there's about 30,000 pages of papers through here. I went through that body of material trying to determine which of his uh, manuscript material, like Sunday sermons, personal letters, all kinds of documents, had to do with secular topics. I didn't care about uh, Isolari's advice to his congregation about how they get to heaven. But what I was concerned with is moments in his sermons when he started to tell families what they could do about neighborhood problems involving their children. And I found a lot of that kind of material. And out of that came the what was the, 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 the second book, Priest, Parish, and People, Saving the Faith in Philadelphia's Little Italy, where I take the experience of this wonderful church, which unfortunately got closed down by the Archdiocese a few years ago, Mary Magdalene de Pazzi, and I tried to use it as a prism to look at the immigrant experience. Uh, some people love the book, some people uh, uh, were not too happy about it. Well, that was the second book. And uh, this was a nightmare in terms of translation because uh, Isolari was a very um, cantankerous guy and he has a lot of problems with the nuns that he's brought to serve the orphanage, which is a night cover is the, the building right next to the church itself. He had an orphanage and school there. Uh, but I got um, a, an interesting book, I think, out of that, out of the 30,000 pages plus other materials. Uh, and uh, I was really on a roll. And then I came to my third major experience, which is Little Italy in the Great War. And I'm going to read to you something that I just discovered in my notes that uh, uh, some reflections on writing Little Italy in the Great War. People have already asked me why I wrote this book. I prefer to see the question as why I had to write this book. The answer is complicated. Years ago, when I was working on my doctoral dissertation, I spent much time interviewing elderly Italians about their life in America. One of the questions I usually asked them was why they had chosen to come. And much to my surprise, a few of them included among other reasons that they did not want to serve a compulsory military obligation in the Italian army. This is in, in the late 1960s, I'm interviewing these guys. Vietnam is hot and uh, there's a big controversy in the United States about guys going to, to uh, Canada, right? And I'm discovering that a lot of these elderly Italians in South Philadelphia were renetanti, draft dodgers themselves, okay? They also went on to say, and each guy did the same thing. He would lean back and start smiling and then laugh and say, you know what happened to me? I ended up in a khaki uniform as a doughboy on the Western Front in the US Army. A lot of these guys went into the Pennsylvania National Guard because uh, as in the recent years for Hispanics, Latinos, right? Uh, the uh, military service was a real opportunity for them. The National Guard was a relatively safe kind of thing. And they jumped at the chance to uh, pursue their life in America by becoming uh, members of the Pennsylvania National Guard which unbeknownst to them is going to be federalized when we get into the, the war in 1917, we declare war, right? Uh, and uh, so they uh, often ended up, uh, I just uh, was reading today that about 300,000 uh, American, Italian Americans served in the first world war, uh, about 60,000 of them are Italian born. Okay, the rest were sons of uh, sons or grandsons, but mainly sons of Italian families. Um, so in later years, I often thought about that answer, that surprising answer that these guys, among other reasons, of course, the major reason was the work opportunities they came for. And I, I like to point out, I, I can't bear the concept of the American dream because it is a, a BS concept invented in the 1930s by a right wing political historian, popular political historian, to glorify America. Um, we know, given the high rates of repatriation, that these guys came to America because there was money to be made here. And they were here, not because they were pursuing an American dream, but they were pursuing an Italian dream. Their obligation was to go back with the wealth of America and in, in, improve the lives of the families they had left behind. They had, they had departed from their families, but they hadn't really left 
them behind. My, my own father who came here in 1922 was supposed to come back to Italy with dowry money for his sisters. And he became persona non gratis in his own family because he met my mother and got married and started to have a family here and never got back to Italy. Uh, and uh, there was a lot of tension with his parents and the rest of his family. And uh, I didn't realize how bad it was until 1987 when I made my first trip over there and met his sisters and my cousins, first cousins, uh, and learned that uh, there, there, there was some uh, disappointment in my father's failure to return with the uh, dowry money. And my, my cousin, who had lived in Yonkers, New York, and then retired back there, said to me that these people here did not really understand how hard it was for uh, that those members of their families that had gone to America and were expected to come back with the wealth of America and uh, were not very uh, sympathetic with uh, the inability to do that. But in any case, uh, I was intrigued by the notion that many of these guys had been draft evaders. Italy had a draft law since about eight, the 1880s, 1890s, it first went into effect, and they fiddled around with it. Uh, and uh, many of these men knew that Italy was embarking on a perilous course in the early 20th century, uh, even before the First World War loomed, the Great War loomed. And they didn't want any parts of it. And uh, uh, among other reasons, uh, secondary perhaps to the economic reason, but uh, the reason of avoiding the compulsory military service was there for uh, many of them. As I was trying to put that book, in the, the book that's going to come out of this into a broader perspective, I found myself thinking about those comments. And I realized that those men that went into the war, went into the Great War, and went, went to the Western Front as Italians, often unable to even speak English. Uh, and there were special units that never got uh, sent overseas that were kept in the United States, training units. Uh, they had, some, they had uh, uh, rather uh, uh, polite names for them, but they were basically men that had not been acculturated enough to American ways to put into combat, it would be too risky to put them into combat uh, because they might not understand orders. They might put uh, military operations at peril. But for those men who went into the war, whether they went over there or stayed here, um, they went into the war as Italians, often unable to even speak English. But when the war ended, they came back to Philadelphia and other cities as veterans of the American army and they came back as Italian Americans. Uh, but if they had been changed as individuals, I was also becoming aware that their home front in Little Italy, by its involvement in the war, had also been altered from a colony of Italian immigrants. And you find the, the term Italian colony frequently used in the early uh, newspaper accounts, Italian colony. But after the war, it's going to become a, a labeled by a phrase that we're more comfortable with today, Italian-American community from Italian colony of people who are anticipating their own return to Italy at some point to an Italian-American community of people who have made a transition in terms of their own personal identification. They're no longer Italians, they're Italian-Americans. And even though it, the sociologists in the 1960s, 70s really popularized that term uh, Italian American, but it was being used. I've, I've, found, I've come across it in, in plenty of newspaper articles. They were becoming Italian Americans and their community was becoming an Italian American community. It was no longer the Italian colony. It was an ethnic community rather than an immigrant colony. So what gives it, let me do, just finish a sentence and then Dominic, you're going to ask a question. What gives it scholarly significance, I think, is the fact that when we study assimilation, we often use a rather abstract but vague process to explain individual and collective transformation. While I was beginning to focus on a very specific mechanism that served as one, a concrete pivot to reach that outcome, not the only one, obviously, but one very important one in which these people are going to come back uh, somewhat different than what they uh, went, went uh, uh, first went to war. Um, 
I'll finish this, Dominic, and then you can ask whatever it is. Uh, two things. Uh, uh, one is uh, the work of Peter Belmonte. Sure. Uh, who on World War One, and then I always thought that World War One was, you know, my of minor importance, but World War Two was the thing that really changed the Italian community. And I've written an essay on it called. Uh, uh, it, it, it changed everything, uh, that it changed everything. Anyhow. I um, think the, 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 the process has, it, he's, he's right in a sense that the, world, the Second World War was in a more comprehensive, more profound way, the more transformative thing. But the First World War initiated that process. When they come back at the end of the, second, at the, end of the First World War, if you go to the literature that you can find from the vaudeville stage and look at what uh, popular singers were doing with the WAP from the, the vaudeville stage, it is incredible the, uh, the, what was inflicted on the Italian uh, population during the 1920s and 30s that Italians still had uh, to uh, uh, tolerate. So they were, yeah, to be sure, they were still being seen somewhat as foreigners but the process was now underway. And uh, I'm always amused by the fact that cities like Philadelphia launched these very aggressive and ambitious Americanization programs that um, never really got anywhere. The people who have written, the historians who have written on the Americanization movement have said that basically it failed. And I think what they're really saying is Americanization was occurring on the streets, was occurring in the, ball, the, the, the baseball parks of American cities and kids are learning, not only learning an American game, but they're learning American ways and American identities. Uh, and in the, of course, in the public schools, they're, um, they're becoming American by an evolutionary process, not by the conscious deliberate policies of an Americanization movement. Uh, and I, that's happening in the 1920s and 1930s. The 1940s, puts a, a very powerful accelerating catalyst on it all. Yeah, uh, but I think by the, the late 1930s, these families were very Americanized. They're holding on to their Italian roots to be sure, but they're very Americanized as well. When I was growing up, this is the last point I'll make about this. Um, I often heard my father talk about his experiences as a veteran of the Italian army during the war. Uh, he was in the class of zero, zero very fortunately, because if he had been in the class of 1899, the boys of 99, he would have been on the battlefront at the, the Battle of the Piave, the second Battle of the Piave, which was a, a tough go of it. And Italy put these 18 year old boys into the fray and they turned the tide in favor of Italy. And it was a very decisive uh, moment in the, uh, uh, the spring of 1918, summer of 1918 uh, and reversed the course of the war. But um, my father used to talk about the war. This is the early 1940s. And unlike other American families, he wasn't talking about World War II. He was talking about his experiences in World War I, in which as a member of uh, replacement troops in the 70th Regiment, I think it was, uh, he reached Mestre, which was the jumping off point for the front lines. But the day on his military record, which I have, that he arrives in Mestre, the date of his arrival in Mestre is November 4th, 1918, which is the day of the armistice on the, West, the Italian front. So the day that he arrives to the jumping off point for the, the Austrian Italian front is the day in which Austria surrenders, the Austro-Hungarian Empire surrenders uh, to Italy. Uh, but he used to talk about his experiences uh, all the time, and he, he always used to remind me, "Boy, you've never, you've never been in the army. You've, you've, this would have been an important point of your growing up if you had been uh, had the opportunity to serve." He never let up on that theme, but it was always his experiences related to that first war, the Great War, and it became part of my intellectual formation because I became very sensitive about it. Uh, I feel like it, with all of my work. I've been writing about my father for several books, uh, but it became part of my own intellectual formulation, uh, formation and enabled me to connect my personal and private life in uh, later years. Um, the, the slides that I had um, 
the slides that I have are um, not in any particular order, uh, but take a quick look uh, at them. Uh, this is actually taken in Rome. This is the farewell of an Italian soldier at the Victoria, uh, Victor Emanuel uh, barracks in the city of Rome uh, before he leaves for the front. Uh, these two guys, the first blood to be drawn for Italy in Philadelphia, street fight. One of these guys is already in the Italian army. He answered the call of the Kingdom of Italy to uh, 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 board a ship and go back to Italy uh, with the reservists. The Italian government uh, surprised the population of immigrants over here when it announced that they were all, the men were reservists, men of the appropriate age year at frame were reservists who still had an unfulfilled military obligation to Italy. So one of the brothers has already gone. The other gets into a fight with some Austrians on the streets of Philadelphia, right about the point that the Italy's entrance to the war is being uh, announced. And uh, he is injured and draws blood. Uh, this, is, uh, this is just a cartoonist sketch of uh, their, their saying on the streets of South Philadelphia, everybody's out on the streets discussing what Italy's role will be like May 26, 1915. Um, unfortunately, these, these uh, newspaper photographs don't reproduce very well, but they jammed the docks, the ports uh, in New York and Philadelphia and Boston to say farewell to the reservists who said, okay, we're here, we're ready to go. Uh, and uh, about five or 6,000 of them report and are shipped back to Italy uh, in this early wave uh, in the summer of 1917. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, summer of 19, begins in the summer of, actually begins in 1914. This is 1915. Uh, and um, uh, the newspapers make a big fuss out of this because there's very operatic scenes going on on the docks. There's a lot of singing, there's musical instruments, there's, uh, it's caricature, uh, but it's, it's really happening too. Um, and they're saying the, the women and children are there in tears and saying goodbye to the Italian uh, reservists. Very shortly after all of this started, the Italian government was no longer in a position to call the men back because the troop ships, the, 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 they were originally passenger ships, had been converted into troop ships and they weren't plying the Atlantic any longer. There was no means. And the Italian government also was not providing money. These men had to pay for the passage back to Italy and it becomes a big issue within the Italian community, a, a political issue. Uh, who's gonna, who's gonna uh, pay the, the, the fare of these men? Um, these are reservists in front of the Italian uh, consulate in Philadelphia uh, answering the call. There are several calls. This is uh, August uh, of uh, 1915 uh, and Italy has declared war on Austria and um, the men are now uh, answering the first call. Um, th this is the third call in this photograph in August uh, of 1915. Uh, and uh, the, the, the top of the head, the, the, over the photograph, it says Italian reservists answer last call. The Italian government is gonna make a later call in October, but um, they're not gonna get the, the, the numbers of men that they had hoped to get. Uh, as I said, about five or 6,000 report at this point. Uh, the newspapers get very much involved. There's a lot of material in local newspapers and you've got good sources like Chronicling America, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, 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 US government, uh, the, 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 what's the, uh, the Library of Congress. The Library of Congress files of newspapers, you can go into newspapers from all over the country. Um, Sykes is the name of a uh, cartoonist in Philadelphia, a very prominent political cartoonist. Uh, and he gives this very romantic image of the Italian soldier who looks very much, of course, like a Roman soldier attacking the Habsburg Empire symbol, the eagle, the Habsburg eagle. And it becomes a very dramatic, uh, dramatized and romanticized um, element of popular culture in Philadelphia and elsewhere in the United States. Um, the first movie films, battlefront movie films that come back from the Italian front, um, people jammed the, the movie houses to see these films uh, and they're advertised in the newspapers uh, all the time. And it, they're, they're kind of groundbreaking in terms of uh, cinematography, uh, of cinema history, uh, because um, they're the first 
really good battlefield uh, scenes. And they're also becoming propaganda instruments of the Italian government as well, the Royal Italian government's own official war pictures. Uh, but, uh, uh, and especially uh, the consumers from the Italian American neighborhoods jam the movie houses. Are any uh, of these still available? The, the films themselves? Yeah. I don't know that they are. I've never seen that they were, but that would be great. Uh, I, I think pieces of them, uh, I know Western Front stuff uh, is available, uh, but I'm not sure there's much available from uh, the Italian Front. Uh, now, 1917, a special war commission comes from Italy uh, to uh, seek an increase in uh, American financial support and to try to stir up the patriotic support for the Italian cause. Uh, and they begin to use uh, children in the community, the families themselves volunteer their own children, dress them up. The one little girl here is an American flag. The other little girl, you can't see it very well, uh, is wrapped in an Italian flag. Um, and they are on the street. The commission that came included uh, Nitti, a future prime minister, included uh, Marconi, uh, uh, Guglielmo Marconi, included a whole bunch of people who are going to be even more important in subsequent Italian history. And they tour American cities. They tour wherever there are large Italian populations, immigrant communities with large populations. And they turn out these huge audiences. And uh, I, I, uh, some people would have probably, other scholars might have uh, avoided it, but I make give it an important part of my book uh, because I think what this was also doing was legitimizing the Italian community because it's a celebration of the Italian presence. Because if you read the newspaper accounts uh, and read what is being celebrated, uh, the Italians uh, in Philadelphia are saying, we are here, we are present, we are important, respect us. Uh, and uh, they give detailed accounts and they're very emotional accounts. Some of them are very hard to read because you really choke up as you read uh, some of the man on the street type interviews and what the ordinary people are saying about what this moment means to them. Um, and, and here is a ceremony in front of Independence Hall honoring the parents of the first uh, known local boy to die in an Italian uniform on the Italian front. Uh, and uh, this the same thing, I, I, I think the, uh, uh, in, in the picture is Marconi, uh, and part of the, uh, the Italian War Commission um, uh, 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 signing a uh, decoration that comes from the King of Italy, comes from Victor Emmanuel II uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, the family, uh, South Philadelphia family. This is a wonderful shot. Uh, I Actually, the, the version I use in the book is taken from a different angle, but you have uh, two saints. I think you have St. Anthony of Padua and, and an angel, an archangel, one saint and an archangel. Uh, and in the middle is a doughboy. And his hat looks, makes him look more like a fireman because the brim of the hat has broken off in time. And it look, doesn't look like the overseas hat that they, they wore, but uh, he's a, it's the a burial place of a, a Philadelphian who had served on the Western Front. Uh, and the, uh, in this cemetery, it's one of those types of, of cemeteries where the Italian graves are sometimes really uh, very uh, eye-engaging works of art. Uh, this is right near uh, the, the, the burial site of Eddie Lang, the famous jazz guitarist, which is how I, I found this, because I was out there to do some photographing of Eddie Lang's uh, grave site and turned around and saw this, what I thought was a spectacular grave site. These are almost life-size figures. They're just about life-size figures. Uh, and the doughboy is as important as the saint and the archangel in, in here. Uh, this is part of the uh, uh, that I what, what I mentioned before um, a federalized former National Guard that's NGP is National Guard Pennsylvania on the way to the armory. They're about to be federalized and become part of the new National Army. We declared war in uh, what spring of 1917. We had no uh, standing military to speak of, and it takes nearly a year to mobilize a sufficient uh, fighting force to send with Pershing and the uh, Allied, ex the American Expeditionary Force to France, to the Western Front. Uh, and we don't reach the battlefield 
in any sub significant numbers until about June of 1918. We're only in the war for about five months. Uh, and of course, the Italians have been in it since 1915. This is now 1918. We, we declare war in 17, send them the troops finally mobilized over in 18. And within those troops are units that had so many Italian boys. Uh, and uh, as in the case of this National Guard unit that's been federalized into part of, into becoming part of the new American army, the National Army, they had many of these boys had served in the forays on the Mexican border when they were pursuing uh, the, the, the US government was pursuing Pancho Villa down there. Uh, and this unit had so many Italian boys in it that, as you can see from the, the caption above the photo, the Italian brigade of the third regiment. Uh, uh, it, if you look at the names uh, and you look at the actual rosters, you don't see that exclusively an Italian presence, but you do see a hell of a lot of Italian names. Uh, and uh, you can understand why with what newspaper people uh, tend to do looking for the good story, uh, they might be tempted to, to say Italian brigade. Um, Camp Mead in Maryland, which is now a major intelligence base, right? Uh, is uh, was the place that was built from scratch to train boys from the East Coast states uh, to ready themselves for the Western Front. I have a lot of material that I've written about in the book on uh, the training and what happens to Italian boys who uh, arrive and have their first real immersion with non-Italian uh, men of their same, uh, same age. I have a long series of, of anecdotal type articles by a guy named Bob who was writing to his mother and his sisters. And then when I, I finished this whole series of articles and wrote about what Bob was saying, because Bob frequently alludes to the Italian boys he's meeting for the first time. And you know, they're just like us, he's saying, which is really great, which is really important. Uh, I came to the conclusion largely because my, my wife had reached the conclusion long before me that this was all a, a hoax. There, were, there was no real Bob. This was a propaganda effort to keep morale on the home front up uh, with a series of kind of fake articles. Um, because what I've read, what I've read subsequently was that uh, the depiction of the training camps uh, often projected a sense that these were like summer camps for children. It was fun and games. These boys were really happy to be there. They're going off to war and many of them are gonna get killed but they're happy to be giving their service to Uncle Sam. And you see it reflected in these pictures of these smiling guys. This is a better picture, it's from Library of Congress uh, of their arrival. Uh, and uh, I found some wonderful newspaper accounts of what happened on their ar arrival. And um, there's uh, references to the ethnicity of the boys. Uh, the Jewish guy who takes the lead of the, the, the marchers uh, is uh, Jaime Schwartz from South Philadelphia. And he's singing at the head of this, this crowd and all the boys are joining in with him. And it's, they're great vignettes. They're very colorful vignettes. These are probably truer than some of the other stuff that I've dealt with. James Giordano was the first Philadelphian to die in the war, actually die in the war. He, he died on the battleground near Syracuse, New York in a training camp incident. He was in a tent. Uh, I think they were all playing cards and somebody in another tent fired a pistol that broke through that tent and entered the tent where Giordano was and hit him and he died uh, a, a little bit afterward. Uh, he was, if you, you can't, probably can't, I don't know if you can read this. He was not yet 15 years old. He shouldn't have been in uniform. He lied to the uh, enlistment officer uh, to, to get accepted as a volunteer. Uh, but the, and that, that was a frequent thing that people of all backgrounds were doing. Boys were getting caught up in patriotic fervor. Uh, and, uh, and this is a, a great shot, one of my favorite shots. Um, St. Donato's Church, which is in West Philadelphia, which is a large satellite community of the big hub of South Philadelphia. But West Philadelphia is another a uh, place where lots of Italians. And the priest is blessing the members of his parish who are about to be shipped overseas. He's giving a final blessing. Um, I tried to find out in some cases I could 
which of these guys survived and which of them were wounded and which of them were, were killed in the course of the war uh, to add to the poignancy of this scene here because the, the newspaper uh, photograph identifies uh, all of them by name. So I could track them down in the casualty accounts that we're using. Here's uh, Liberty Loan stuff uh, that uh, I'll skip over, but now I'm, I'm dealing with home front stuff and trying to deal with what was happening. The Giannini sisters were the members of a family, a very famous family in the Italian colony. Their father, Ferruccio Giannini, ran a thing called the, 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 the Verdi Theater. It was a big um, uh, vaudeville and cinema theater. Um, uh, the Giannini on top sang as a lead soprano at La Scala. Uh, she was uh, uh, America's Aida. Uh, I have a great one page article from Time Magazine around 1929 about Dusselina Giannini. Well, they were young girls at the time and they're, uh, they're part of, when I, I submitted a draft to this to Temple University Press and one of the readers said, there's not enough about women and children, about women. So I took the manuscript back and wrote quickly, about a month's time, a chapter on women and invariably it had to become about children as well and how they got sucked up into the war and participated in the patriotic effort on the, the, the home front. Uh, and you'll, you'll see a little bit more about that in a moment. But uh, the Giannini sisters were singing at Liberty Loan rallies. Uh, we all know about Caruso singing God Bless America and that kind of stuff in New York City at the Liberty Loan rallies there. Uh, but uh, it was going on all over the country. And uh, this, is, uh, this is significant for Philadelphia because of what happens to uh, Dusselina Giannini later in later years. Mary Sabatini was a translator in, the, in City Hall and I wanted to uh, try to expand as much as I could that the participation of women was not just participation at Liberty Loan rallies as entertainers at Liberty Loan rallies, but Mary Sabatini was a translator in City Hall. And what was happening of course was opportunities for women were starting to open up because there weren't enough men around to, to, to de deal with this. Uh, these are Liberty Loan collectors uh, during the third Liberty Loan drive, which is in the fall of 1918. And this woman, uh, I, I don't know if you can, if she's in the second row, the second from the right in the second row is my baptismal godmother. Uh, she was the sister uh, of another very good singer uh, a woman named Elvira Cavalieri, who was a great uh, soprano. Uh, and my aunt Elsie, she wasn't really my aunt, she was my aunt by baptism, uh, was her sister. Uh, and I came across this photograph and I was thrilled when I found it in the, in the uh, uh, newspaper. And I'm gonna use it in the book. I take it and I start to process it and I start to read the names and I think Elsie, uh, Cavalieri, wait a minute, that's Elsie Maru, whom I knew as Elsie Maricello after she got married. That's my Aunt Elsie, my baptismal godmother. And I look back at the picture and I say, sure enough, that's her. But these were women who, who uh, uh, they turned loose through South Philadelphia to knock on doors and to solicit contributions for the Liberty Loan drives, which were to finance the war. Um, and there's a, disastrous, uh, there's a disastrous episode attached to all of this because in October of 1918, the third Liberty Loan Drive has a massive public parade in Philadelphia. And it is probably the most important event triggering the influenza epidemic in Philadelphia. Because within a week, there's like 300,000 people jammed the streets of Philadelphia for this parade to support the purchase of bonds to support the war effort, the, the loans for the war effort. Uh, and within a week of the parade, people are dying in the hundreds in Philadelphia as a result of the influenza epidemic. And they realized that uh, that was the, the public Petri dish that we put these people uh, on and made them vulnerable. And this is illustrative of the uh, use of the children. Uh, I had a Navy uniform, I had an Army uniform during the Second World War, and I never realized that it was being used for propaganda efforts. <laughs> well, I would have been fully supportive of it at that point. But um, uh, routinely to dress kids in, in military uniforms and turn them loose on public occasions and uh, often finding their way into newspaper photographs, a very commonplace kind of thing to um, 
elevate the, the sympathies of the, the public in support of the war, you know, uh, uh, and um, the schools, uh, again, were cauldrons of Americanization. And this is a school that had a very large Italian, primarily Italian, secondarily Jewish population uh, in South Philadelphia. Uh, and this is where, in fact, Eddie Lang, the guitarist, and uh, Frank uh, uh, Joe Venuti, the jazz violinist, the two very famous musicians, uh, both attended school. Wrap up. In th this kind of orchestra. I have, a, I have a, a photograph of one of the orchestras with Eddie Lang in it. It's not this one, it's another one, but Eddie Lang is like a 10 year old, uh, which uh, I'll use somewhere in the future. Uh, but uh, uh, the next photograph says it all. What was once little Italy is young America now. Uh, and it reinforces the point that I was making was this is a very important time of Americanization uh, because these people are swept up with as much patriotic fervor, um, their, their allegiance and support for the Italian forces on the Italian front is tra being transferred over to the Western front because regardless of how many or how few boys went, answer the call of the Italian army, the reservists who went to Italy to fight, many, many more were gonna end up uh, in the, the, the Western front. I, I started to mention that, that about 300,000 Italians, uh, Italian Americans uh, went into the US Army during the First World War. About 60,000 were Italian born. About 300,000. Really fascinating stuff, but we've got to move to uh, questions. So if you could wrap up. Okay. Okay, the women have always helped. Lord bless them. General Diaz comes at the end of the war to Philadelphia. The end of the war, they're returning from the, the war front. They're also going back to Italy. They're going in both directions. The last photograph, there's a guy taking on one of the docks in Philadelphia. It looks like a caricature. I, when I look at it, I would say, no, nah, they made this up. But this was a guy photographed on a dock in Philadelphia on his way back to Italy because Italy, the economy of Italy was expected to prosper uh, in the post-war period. Uh, and the, the reasons, the economic reasons for migrating to America were supposedly starting to reverse themselves. So a lot of Italians now with the resumption of the steamship uh, service, were going to return to Italy looking for prosperity in Italy. Uh, of course, it didn't, didn't quite work out uh, as well for them, uh, perhaps as, as for those who, who stayed. In any case, this is what this last book has been uh, pretty much about. Uh, I've dealt with the war experience. I've dealt with the home front. Uh, I've tried to, to cover some areas that uh, have been, I think, have been pretty much neglected. Uh, I was once being interviewed for a public uh, broadcast um, network in a cable network, public broadcast cable network in Pennsylvania. And the guy who was interviewing me, who was a very bright guy, one of the co-founders of uh, C-SPAN, in fact, who had left and, and helped start this network in, in Pennsylvania, was surprised, kind of surprised, uh, when I reminded him that Italy had been on the side of the Allies in the First World War. He said, oh, yeah, yeah, Italy was on our side, right? And I said, yeah, Brian, yeah. And uh, that was another reason I wanted to write this book, because I thought that um, people think of Italy and international war, they think of Mussolini and the Axis and Mussolini and Hitler and all that kind of thing. And they forget that this is, this is um, I think America's, uh, th this is a kind of a forgotten front. Uh, the Great War was fought on many different fronts, not just the Western Front. It was fought in what, Gallipoli and in, in Asia, and it was fought uh, in the Italian front in, in the Northeast corner of Italy. Incidentally, the end of the war, uh, Italy uh, has waged battle on a battlefront that is probably longer than the Western Front. If you measured out the miles, uh, not as the bird flies, but in and out, Italy is, has waged war on a battlefront that is probably longer, wider uh, than the Western Front was. As you all know, I'm sure, it was a, 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 a terrain that is almost impossible to negotiate your way in because of the mountains and the, the snow. Okay, let's go to questions. And the third thing, last thing, last point I make, Italy, Italian forces were the only allied military forces 
to be occupying enemy territory when the war ended. Because on the Western Front, where were we? We were in France and Belgium when the war ended. Italy was in the territory of the Austro-Hungarian Empire when the war ended. Okay. Go ahead, Dominic. Okay, thanks. Uh, uh, Carla, do you have a question? Uh, you're always number one with us. Oh, I'm always number one. <laughs> Uh, first of all, I just want to say thank you to uh, Professor Giuliani for this really interesting presentation. I, I mean, so many things came to mind when I was listening to you. I mean, from the Italian perspective, World War I is considered a turning point in establishing Italian identity because it was right. the first time when you had Italians from different regions together right. in the troops and recognizing each other as compatriots. So, uh, right. 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 so it's interesting that it happened, uh, it, how it functioned for Italianness in Italy. Italy and then also yeah. this Italian Americanness. Uh, the response, the response to Caporetto unified mm -hmm. Italy uh, yeah. in an unprecedented way. Mm -hmm. uh, Italy's industrial productivity soared. Yeah. Austria's was collapsing, uh, but Italians came together in a way that astonished the world. I yes. think. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and I know uh, a lot's been written too. How Italy seems to have gotten left out, even though it was an ally with the aftermath. But that's a whole other story. Mm -hmm. But I did want to ask one specific yes, thing please. because I, you know, I teach a lot of Italian American literature, and uh, many of them have um, elements where the the authors have researched their own families. And more than once, there are figures of men going in to serve in World War I, and uh, that was a means of getting US citizenship. And I've heard right, different right. things about that. Was it guaranteed, or was that part of the, uh, the hook yeah. to get them to um, enlist? Or you know, what is yeah. the actual history behind that? Originally, I mean, we have a, 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 a diplomatic agreement, a diplomatic agreement, not a law, but a diplomatic agreement with Italy that dates back to 1871 that we will not impress um, men from the, others, the other population, both it's a mutual pact between Italy and the United States. And it's in effect when the, the great war begins. Hmm. Uh, the United States is faced with manpower uh, problems yes. uh, and has this huge population of Italians in the, of, of uh, immigrants of all backgrounds, uh, but it can't, the, the law also prohibits the United States government from drafting them when we passed the, the Selective Service Act in the spring of 1917, we can't touch them, but we can require them to register. Well, that's a dirty, sneaky first step. Uh, we, we, uh, if an Italian boy had taken out his first papers, mm -hmm. he was, in the eyes of the US government, vulnerable to the draft then. Mm. Uh, and they began sucking them into the US Army. Mm -hmm. The U.S. Uh, government established naturalization courts on the military basis, and uh -huh. on some specific days, you might have two or three hundred uh, uh, aliens being naturalized, many of whom would have been Italians. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a, um, a, a fast track to uh, yeah. naturalization. Yeah, that, so yeah. that's Italians how it's portrayed in the this, literature, that it was yeah, a this way, is an yeah. opportunity for mm -hmm. us. We're going to get in and... Uh, 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 whatever we fear as restrictions is going to be relaxed, the uh, language considerations or any, 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 any blocking uh, uh, mechanism. So uh, they're eager to, to go through this kind of thing. So uh, I, I, I wrote quite a bit about the naturalization proceedings. Mm -hmm. And there's some other good work I could refer you to uh, that deals with this, this, this kind of thing. Uh, mm -hmm. But it was a device to um, uh, we could and we could not send them into foreign battle unless they were citizens. Oh, so we oh, had to naturalize them in mm -hmm. order to get them into uniform fully and to get them into combat. Uh, okay. And uh, that was what the United States was very devious at this time. <laughs> uh, it continually promises hints at the deployment of American troops in Italy. Uh, one, uh, you know. Um, uh, Aviators were trained in Italy down near Bari at, at the uh, at Foggia, uh, mm -hmm. the Foggiani, where uh, LaGuardia uh, was commander. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Italians thought that, uh, and there's two uh, naval air, and this is the beginnings of the US naval air and the US army air too. Mm -hmm. um, and the Italians, I think, thought that when these men were, these Americans were trained they're going to be uh, bombing the, the naval base at Paula, the, the naval base in uh, the, the, the other Paula in Austria. Mm -hmm. uh, they're going to be bombing on the Austrian front. They made a few meager forays, 
but they were all moved to the Western Front mm. because uh, the sense of the US command Pershing uh, and uh, his subordinates was we needed all the manpower there. Mm. We put one unit into action uh, ground forces, 332nd Infantry Regiment, which was originally an Ohio Infantry Regiment, an Ohio National Guard unit. They were in combat action for 10 minutes on the morning of November 4th, the day of the armistice. Uh, there, there's a fantastic story behind them, uh, which I've been writing about. Uh, and um, they went into one, uh, well, before they went into combat, they would go from village to village, changing uniforms and parading through the villages so that it looked like there were many well, more there than more there people. actually were. Yeah. Uh, and when they got to the combat experience, one man died, a, few, a handful of, of, of wounded men, only one man dies. They were being told in one village after another, if you had been here a half hour, you would have encountered Austrians, but their lines have broken and they're, they're running pell-mell back to Vienna. Uh, and uh, they were in co actual combat action for mm. about 10 minutes. 10 minutes. <laughs> and a train going by my house. Uh, and it's a farce. But Italy was, was getting signals from the United States all during the war that we're going to be sending troops to help and you. It didn't happen, so. And it, it, I don't think the United States ever had any intention mm. of doing that. I, I refer to it as the deceptive alliance. And mm -hmm. Italy is going to be di disappointed about six different ways with American national policy, foreign policy, uh, after the war with uh, Wilson's right, yeah. no, reversal. I've heard a lot about that. They were like, did we, the stuff. war we won but lost is yeah, so it's yeah, referred they, to uh, in Italy. I the mutilated <laughs> victory, the, the, right, what's called the right, mutilated yeah. victory, yeah. Right, right. I've just been reading this morning an article by Spencer De Scala on uh, Prime Minister Orlando and the, uh, the, the, the liberal politics that have been defamed in Italy and uh, the Scala uh, defends Orlando and says he got, gets a really bad rap both from the left and the right yes. uh, about what he was up to. Uh, okay, other questions? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank Mary you, Carla. Hi, Mary Gibson. Yes. Hi, it says Carla on my thing. That's my daughter. I don't know how that happened. This computer's acting up today. Anyway, something you said, Richard, just uh, resonated with me about your father. Yes. You said that that when he came here to America, he was supposed to help other his other relatives right. get here, just, and they was, they were. You didn't, no, he was pardon? supposed to, to. He was supposed to return with dowry money for his to enable his sisters to get married oh, in Italy. Okay, in Italy. well, yeah. well th yeah. my father's story is very, is very similar. Yeah. You know, he was in the First World War. He fought in the Italian army sure. and then, uh, you know, got here, got here to America. An, an, an acting company picked him up and he was a silent movie actor for a few years. And then when that failed, when talking pictures came in, he had to go back to Italy, but he was already... I discovered in looking up his papers, he was already a, an American citizen, but he went back to Italy because he was broke, of course, and uh, met my mother. And my mother was sort of an heiress, even though, you know, she had limited education, but she had land, you know, so that was a big deal. So he, he married my mother and was given a dowry and money to return to America. And he was supposed to help the, the rest of the family get over here. Well, once he got here, he came in 1929, a month before the stock market crashed. I mean, there was like, you know, it was utter chaos in America at that time. So he had to get what jobs he could. And then once my mother came over a year later, they started having kid after kid. You know, he didn't have any money to send them. Right, you know, right. he'd send them exactly. what he could. But, you know, but they always thought that America was, was you know, the streets were paved with gold because they had nothing over there. My parents came from Sicily. They didn't have running water. They didn't have electricity. They didn't even have it probably until the 1960s, you know, before they really, people 
you know, in their region really got those things. So there was always this resentment. I never, I was so shocked to hear that it's still going on. I mean, these people are all dead now. My father would be 126 if he was still alive, but this resentment is still carrying on to other generations that my father did not keep his promise and help them get here. It is just it's unbelievable. Funny in recent in recent months, the, those politicians that are very hostile to the unfortunate folks from Latin America who would like to enter the United States have been using the phrase chain migration as a dirty phrase. Um, right. Our people relied on chain migrations to get here very much. Um, it was a, a, a Paisani linked migration where uh, relatives and friends from the village would uh, tell you, give you the inspiration to come, perhaps even pre-purchase the ticket for you to come, facilitate your arrival by meeting you at the port of arrival, help you with uh, accommodations, help you to find a job. Um, these are chains of migration. This has been written about um, for 30 years and it's been going on for 150 years at least. It's the way that all peasant mm -hmm. migrations are mm -hmm. socially organized. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I remember being very annoyed when I saw some of these news articles recently where these people are using the phrase uh, chain migration as if it's a dirty word, you know, a dirty phrase that these, uh, these Nicaraguans are coming by chain migration. So what? So did my father. My yeah. father actually lost his slot to come in 1921 and came in 1922 with uh, Montreal as his destination and came across the border illegally later on in that year was an illegal entrant to the United States and uh, was an enemy alien, of course, during the Second World War, as my mother was. Uh, and uh, so I'm very sympathetic to <laughs> open gates <laughs> and Ooh. illegal migrants because my father yes. was very yes. illegal. Yes. My father came here as a teenager, and that's how he ended up in the army, because yeah. he yeah. came with no papers. He wasn't even able to read or write. Yeah. So he got sent back to Italy and you know a vagrant he was a vagrant kid he lived in the street they put those boys in the army when he was like 16 17 and then of course when world war one came along you know well he had had all this training then by then you know yeah, but yeah. he was captured by the Germans spent more than a year in prison camp well thank I you have very much your talk was excellent I have a quick little comment um, I think the Italian expression fare l'America expresses quite well the reason some of the immigrants came. They didn't come necessarily to stare in America, but they came to fare l'America, in other words, to get rich and send money home right, and right. everything. And I just wanted to mention something kind of interesting. I have a document from Italy from 1896 when my maternal grandfather was 20 years old exempting him from military service due to grave debolezza costituzionale. Whether it was really that or whether uh, it wasn't, it says proven in this document, but who knows. But I also have his registration certificate with the US military dated September 12th, 1918, when he was already 44 years old. Yeah, yeah. So I think they really, they were maybe getting kind of desperate towards the end of the war yeah. and took every, everybody who wanted to register. And I have one other quick, a quick little question. Do you have any, have you studied or do you have any um, knowledge or, or research done on Italians who eventually came to this country but served in the Italian army in World War I and were prisoners of war in Austria? My father was one of those. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't have any more information than you probably have yourself, Laura, uh, <laughs> unfortunately. But uh, yeah, um, I, have, I have from time to time encountered someone who said that uh, somebody in their family had been captured. And incidentally, um, in a lot of my work, uh, I've tried to raise the argument that it's time to get beyond Hemingway because uh, most Americans, <laughs> What they know of the First World War comes from a novel that swept the country in the 1920s, right? 
uh, mm. that was sweet it was sens a sensational novel because it is partly a war story and partly a love story and the love story was a salacious love story that shocked everybody in america right uh but he did a fairly decent job in describing the uh, retreat at Caporetto, but there is so much, much more to Caporetto than what Hemingway described. And uh, that imagery of the default of the collapse of the Italian army has done a great deal of harm to the image of the Italian military and the image of uh, the Italian, I think. Uh, and uh, I think, again, there's, there's a lot of good stuff. I, I urge people to read uh, Mark Thompson, The White War, wonderful book, The White War by Mark Thompson. He is a British journalist uh, who's written, I've read the book three times. Let's move uh, to Lou Corsino. Lou, you got a question? Yeah, I, I do. There's, there's, there's a lot of, I know we're pressed for time. There's a lot of things that are interesting about the critique of the American dream. But one of the things that, uh, that I've wondered about, this is a question to Richard, but maybe everyone, but I know everyone can't answer at this time. But um, uh, when I, when I studied at Notre Dame, I studied with Bill Antonio and Lamana, but I never thought about studying Italians. I never thought, I, that was, I, I didn't start to look at Italians uh, until later in my academic career. But you said early on, Richard, that you're, you wrote some papers uh, as an undergraduate uh -huh. and then did your dissertation. Uh -huh. and, and if you would have been German, if you would have been Jewish, if you would have been somewhat, you think you would have done it, or at what point, did you come to the realization that Hi, my personal life, my personal life growing up as Italian is also a part of my professional life. I could, I could mine that for my professional life. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's fascinating to me for every, all the people on, on this chat. I mean, I think whether or not it happened early on, later on, but I'm interested in your response in terms well, of. I, I think it's a hard question to answer because uh, what you're looking for is a decisive moment, which really changed me as a person. And I'm not sure if, if I had it. I do know that I felt very marginal because there were times when I was very much aware of an Italian identity. Uh, and of course, uh, growing up in the 40s and 50s, we weren't Italian Americans, we were Italians, <laughs> right? Uh, but there were other times when I felt like I wanted to get away from it as well. And I kind of vacillated between one polarity and the other, back and forth, back and forth. But I had a, I had a very good uh, uh, instructor in social problems in the sociology department at ND, a guy named Bob Vasoli. And he <laughs> gave us a list of topics to write term papers on for his course. And it was probably the longest and most difficult term paper I've ever had to write as a college student. And one of them was discrimination, prejudice and discrimination against Italian Americans. And I chose that. And so I think it was more a reflection of a happy accident of, of, of meeting Bob Masoli as my professor in the social problems course that led me uh, in that uh, direction. Um, I, I think that there were some encounters with relatively open-minded uh, uh, instructors, professors uh, that uh, did encourage you to go off in, in different directions. Uh, but I've also been urged, greatly urged, to study other groups, which I, I don't find nearly as interesting, but I, I will have a book coming out sometime this late this summer on the German Americans of Philadelphia, <laughs> I might <laughs> brag about, uh, because uh, they too had a very difficult circumstance during the First World War. The subtitle of the book is From um, um, uh, Colonial Settlers to Enemy Aliens. Yeah. Uh, and as you know, uh, they, they really, uh, put against uh, during the First World War, uh, and they were the uh, the suspected terrorists of the right. of our population during the First World War. And there are, there are, there were claims of a hundred different two hundred different incidents of sabotage involving German Americans. They've only documented with any evidence maybe one or two episodes. There was an explosion of an ammunition dump in New York Harbor near the Statue of Liberty. Uh, Black Tom, uh, and uh, there was another similar incident somewhere else, but there was a lot of exaggeration, and German Americans were, there was one German American who was hung out and was in an Iowa or Kansas, somewhere out near you guys, uh, who was tarred and feathered and then, then hung 
uh, as, a, as treason, uh, being treasonous to the United States. He was an innocent guy. Um, but um, uh, I, 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 I guess, I don't know. I, I, when I started graduate study at Penn, I thought I was going to study black white relations. It was the civil rights era. And I was very much interested in black history. And I thought I was going to be a specialist in race relations, the sociology of race relations. But as I said, I fell into the grasp of Edward P. Hutchinson and he opened the door to allow me to study uh, white immigration, white ethnicity and immigration. And I, I jumped on that opportunity. I, I thought it was gonna be fun. Uh, okay, one more question and then we'll wrap. Who's got a question? Speak up. Sure, may I ask a question? Hello. Of course. That's From question. Rome, yes. First of all, your presentation was very articulated and intriguing. Compliments for your research. As an expert in the sociology, and um, my question comes from this other side of the world, because, because um, immigration is a global, migration is a global phenomenon. Um, Italy is, has been turning into a country from emigrants to immigrants. Now, what is immigration? What is migration? Why do people move? Um, this is a question that sociologists certainly have been asking themselves. So my question is, and do you think that the Italian American migration wave has anything in common or differs from other migration waves throughout the world? Uh, I think the answer is yes to both to both issues that you raised. It does have a lot in common uh, because basically it was motivated by the poverty of Italy and the desire of these people to improve their material circumstances and, and improve the material life of their, their families. On the other hand, each migration has its own particular details, has its own particular nuances. And uh, the Italian American experience, the Italian experience of the late 19th, early 20th, and in, into the post World War II period, when Italians were still coming in fairly large numbers, uh, is not precisely uh, uh, identical to what is happening uh, to the United States with migrants from other parts of the world today. But there, there is sufficient overlap. And I think. You know, I think it's very instructive for us, and I think it put, perhaps puts us in a burden of moral responsibility too, because we've seen this with our people. Uh, and um, I, I can't understand the attitudes of some of my co-nationals who uh, have harsh attitudes towards these poor, unfortunate people whose lives, are, very lives are at risk if they do not escape from their native countries. Uh, I just can't understand that. And I, th I think, you, haven't we learned anything? Uh, my mother used to tell stories about her family as a little girl being chased off the streets of Camden when her parents made the mistake of renting a house in a neighborhood that no Italian family had lived in yet. And they were told they had to get out. And they did move out because their lives were at stake. Uh, and uh, th those kinds of lessons uh, kind of reached me in some way. And I suppose this is why I got interested in the, the race issue uh, when I was in college, uh, because I, I, I saw something very similar to what our own people had gone through. Um, but the answer to the question is yes, uh, yes, there, is, there are common elements that overlap and there are this, uh, differences. It's our task as scholars perhaps to sort out what is similar and what is different, what is distinctive in all of this. Okay. Well, thank that, you very much. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, that's uh, our Zoom for today. Uh, World War I and Italian Americans and the whole idea of Italians uh, becoming uh, American and influenced by World War I events. And uh, uh, thanks much to Rich uh, Giuliani and uh, you have a final word, Rich. Uh, a final word. Um, I'd like to show you one other photograph that I would not be able to access probably, but if uh, when, you, the, when the borders of Italy are opened again to us, do what I did two years ago 
and do your best to get up to the, the memorial shrine at a place called Red de Puglia, which is in the northeast corner of Italy, near almost as far up as Trieste, where over 100,000 Italians, all men, one woman who was a nurse who died at the age of 19 and is buried with her comrades. Uh, but over 100,000 Italians are buried in this monumental staircase that brings a lump to your throat and a, a visual reminder of what this war was about and the costs that, uh, it, it, that Italy was burdened with. Unfortunately, this shrine was built by Mussolini as a propaganda device to promote fascism, but it remains beyond Mussolini uh, as a very, very uh, moving memorial to the war. Over 100,000 uh, men buried there. Uh, and it, it, just, it just reaches to the innermost of your soul uh, when you see this uh, site. It's a little hard to get to, but worth getting to. Our thanks again to Rich Giuliani. Thank you very much, Rich. Thank very you, Dominic, for having me. Interpretation. And as I said, it's just wonderful to be back with this crowd. Uh, you Chicagoans are not bad characters at all. And uh, <laughs> I was privileged to have to, to be able to spend the afternoon with you. So thank you, Dominic, very much. Thank okay. you for a wonderful Grazie, one. arrivederci. Complimenti. Ciao, Carla. Ciao, Richard. Dominic.